You're listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, episode number six, Picky Eating Perspective and Sanity Secrets. Stay calm and carry on. Learn why it really matters how you behave around your picky eater and how staying calm, unemotional, and under-invested in your child's eating can help. Welcome to the Nourish Child Podcast a show about childhood nutrition, feeding kids, and dealing with the ups and downs of growing a healthy child. Here's your host, registered dietitian and childhood nutrition expert, Jill Castle. Hey there, it's Jill Castle, and welcome back to the Nourish Child podcast. Today, I'm talking about how your perspective can help or hinder how you interact with your child who might be going through a picky eating phase, and some sanity secrets or secrets that can help you stay sane, engaged, and positive around your child who is picky. Before we get started, I thought I would reminisce a little bit about my own childhood. I myself was not a picky eater. I did have foods that I didn't care to eat, like mom, if you're listening to this, I apologize, but Navy bean soup was not on my favorite list at all. And there was always a dread I felt whenever my mom would say, we're having navy bean soup. But I wasn't really a picky eater. I pretty much ate everything. Uh, But I did have a sibling who was very picky. And uh, I have distinct memories of my sibling stuffing foods that she did not like down the radiator grid. So my parents had us sit at a separate table when we were little in the kitchen, and it was like a child-sized table with tiny little chairs and just just enough space for three children. And it was pushed up against the wall, and below the wall, or at the bottom of the wall, was a radiator, like a baseboard heating unit. And my sister used to stuff all kinds of things down the radiator. And my brother and I, we, we were in cahoots with her because we would never tell on her, but she would stick green beans down there, green peas, anything she didn't like. But I, I especially remember it seemed like she always stuffed the vegetables down the radiator. Why it did not catch on fire or smoke or have any other sort of adverse reaction, I do not know. But uh, my sister was quite the picky eater. And I remember my parents occasionally making her sit at the table for long periods of time uh, until she finished her plate. Now, we've talked about that before. I talked about that in episode two, uh, when I discussed your feeding style and and how it influences your child's eating. But in the case of my sister, the stuffing of the vegetables down the radiator came after the having to sit at the table for long periods of time. So she compensated, obviously, which many kids do. They compensate with different behaviors so that they don't have to comply or continue the behavior you're asking them to do, such as eating their vegetables. So anyways, when I was writing this story about um, picky eating and and some of the, the secrets to staying sane with your picky eater, that memory came to mind. And it is so common in families. You know, if you think about what is behind picky eating, and just understanding what's behind it and and knowing sort of the factors that contribute to picky eating can really help you keep a good perspective on the whole topic. Typically, uh, kids around age two to six years of age go through a phase called picky eating. And picky eating has a variety of intensity, I think. Uh, you have kids who go through it very quickly, go through the phase very quickly, and get a little choosy or selective with their foods, and then sort of snap out of it quickly and and resume eating all different kinds of foods. And on the other spectrum, you have the children who are very picky, 
some like to call them extremely picky eaters, where they are really sensitive to things like texture or smell or the color of food. This sensitivity really drives their picky eating to a higher degree, a degree where they might not get enough calories in their diet or they might miss out on certain nutrients, particularly if they're uh, eliminating uh, complete food groups from their diet. So there is sort of a broad gamut on the picky eater uh, spectrum. But for the most part, children, and I've seen statistic, statistics as high as 50% of children age 2 to 6 are picky eaters. Um, it's really hard to define what the the prevalence of picky eating is because everybody experiences it differently. And what one parent says is picky eating, another parent might think that that's not picky eating at all, that it's very mild. So your perspective about picky eating really matters. But anyways, it's typical that picky eating would occur between the ages of two and six years of age. Why? It's a developmental stage during childhood where children are basically looking for more independence. They're looking to separate from their parent and do things for themselves. They want to have more say in everything that they do, and oftentimes they choose food because it is the easiest thing for a child to control. At the same time, food neophobia can set in, and food neophobia is basically fear of new food. Why that happens, I'm not exactly sure, but it is pretty well described in the research that food neophobia occurs in those early toddler years, and that can drive picky eating. Obviously, if you have a child who is experiencing food neophobia, they're going to be less inclined to try a new food that you've put in front of them. Another component is food jagging or food jags. Uh, and that's where a child just focuses on one food they like a lot and they want it over and over and over again. It might be the child who wants chicken nuggets every day and really puts up a stink in order to get the chicken nuggets. Or a child who might be just really into watermelon and wanting watermelon with every single meal. That's what a food jag is. It's pretty typical, again, in that two to six year old age range. And it makes sense because if you have a child who is food neophobic, then they're looking for foods that make them feel safe and comfortable. And so they gravitate to the foods that do make them safe and comfortable and ask for them over and over again and want to eat them. Your child's temperament also is related to his picky eating. For example, if you have a really easygoing child who's a pleaser, that child might not demonstrate as much picky eating tendencies as the child who is strong-willed and more demanding. Thinking about your child and who he or she is and how that's represented in their day-to-day -day life can give you a sense of how intense that picky eating phase could actually be for you. Not every child goes through picky eating, uh, but they may go through something else that's similar. My older daughter, I would not call her a picky eater by definition, but she did go through a phase where she wanted to wear this pink Polly Flinders dress every day. I mean, she, I think, wore that dress every single day of her life for a straight six months. And there would be a temper tantrum or a complete meltdown or a refusal to get dressed if she couldn't wear that dress. So, and I let her wear that dress. And I guess that's what happens oftentimes with uh, parents of picky eaters is you just sort of, you give in to the requests. But when it comes to nutrition, it can really have some significant impact on nutritional status and food variety and the ability to move forward with uh, growth and development. So wearing a pink Polly Flinders dress every day for six months was a battle I chose to not engage in. We're going to talk about how to keep your sanity and keep your perspective about it and stay sane, but also 
engage in positive ways that can help your picky eater move along through the phase without extending it or intensifying it for too long. So why do we get frustrated with the picky eater? And honestly, who wouldn't get frustrated with a picky eater is really the issue. They are very frustrating. You put time and effort into making a nutritious meal or cooking something and they reject it. The food you serve might be yucky, and that feels like a personal affront sometimes. You also get frustrated because you feel like you're losing control of your child's eating, which you just had. Remember that baby you had that ate everything? You had full control over that child. Now you have a toddler who is trying to run the show and call the shots and is being very, very frustrating, and you feel absolutely out of control. But the truth is, our frustration with the picky eater often comes from a place of worry. Why do we get worried about the picky eater? Well, we are worried about our child not getting enough to eat. We worry about our child being hungry later on, particularly in the middle of the night when it's totally inconvenient to get up and make something for the child to eat. We worry about being a bad mom or a bad dad one who doesn't have control over their child. And we worry about being neglectful. Most parents that I've worked with don't feel 100% comfortable with letting their child go without eating for a few hours till the next meal. So that frustration and worry may lead us to engage in activities that can intensify or prolong picky eating. That worry, that frustration may lead us to beg or plead with our child to eat. It may lead us to negotiate or bargain with our child. If you eat this, then you can watch TV. Or if you take two more bites, you can get down from the table. It may also lead us to reward our child for eating. If you eat your broccoli, you can have ice cream for dessert. It may also lead us to restrict our child by taking away treasured items such as a beloved blanket or a stuffed animal if they don't eat. It may also lead us to push or pressure our child, reminding them to take another bite, following them with a cup of milk to remind them to drink it, nagging them to finish their plate, talking about food at the table, on and on and on. And last, Frustration and worry can lead us to punish our children for not eating, such as making them sit at the table until they finish their meal, or reserving the food that they didn't eat and serving it again at the next meal. I know that we, as parents, almost never feel good about doing these things. But let's be honest, sometimes they work. But you know what? They don't always work for the long haul. While these approaches, these things like restricting or rewarding or punishing or begging or pleading, while they might make your child compliant for the moment, you're probably not going to get an, a lasting impact. In fact, you might turn your child off, make his picky eating worse, or even worse, make your child dread coming to the table to eat. And that, my friends can disturb his developing relationship with food. If you look at the research on adults who were picky as children, their memories were generally negative about eating and food in childhood. Of course, they remembered the negative feelings they had if they were forced to eat, stay at the table, try a certain number of bites, and many of them in adulthood would not eat the foods they were forced to eat as a child. So you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And the obvious question is, what can you do instead? So of course, I love to provide you with information that you can use as soon as possible, practical, easy tips. And that's what I'm going to do at this point is to give you some sanity saving tips to think about and use with your own picky eater. Number one, keep picky eating in perspective. 
Remember what I said earlier in the show, picky eating is usually a phase. And as phases pass, this will pass too. Just like anything you find uncomfortable, the more you focus on it, the more you let it become a negative force, the more uncomfortable it will be for everyone involved. Just know you got to move through this phase. And the goal is to move through as quickly and as uneventfully as you possibly can. Stay positive. I know it's hard when you're frustrated and you're worried. What is the immediate facial expression that comes? A frown, a face of anger. But if you can smile, that can be just one of the easiest ways to keep your brain engaged and happy and positive, but also demonstrate to your child that they're not getting under your skin. So smile. Agree with your child when you can. And keep your mouth shut about food most of the time. Find the humor. Don't laugh at your child, but look for those funny quirky behaviors that they do, and they all do them. They all have their little idiosyncratic behaviors around food and eating, and relish those. Just look for the humorous side of things and remember them and relish them. And last, to keep things in perspective, learn with your child. Remember, children are learning to eat. They don't, they are not born knowing how to eat. In fact, eating is a developmental process with very measured, timely steps to learn how to chew, learn how to swallow, learn how to engage with food. So if you keep in mind that your child is learning about food, about the foods that he likes, the foods that he doesn't like, that can help you sort of let that picky eating roll off your back. For example, if you're, chi- if you're feeding your child green peas and they're like, yuck, no, shaking their head back and forth, I don't like this, you just shrug, shrug your shoulders and say, okay, well, that's okay, we'll try that next time, and you move on. Number two, remember your job, and you and your child have your own jobs. Remember, I talked about this also in episode two when I talked about feeding styles, you have the job of feeding and your child has the job of eating. And this is all based on the division of responsibility by Ellen Satter. And I'll include the link to her website in the show notes so you can go and look at that more in detail. But essentially, your job is to decide what your child's eating, when he's eating it, so that's your schedule for meals and snacks, and where he's eating it. Typically for the younger child, that's the high chair. The older child, that's at a table. Your child's job is to decide whether he's eating what you serve and how much he's eating. So I always say to many of my families, just pat yourself on the back when you get a meal in front of your child that has a good representation of the food groups, shows off a colorful variety of foods, and also includes at least one or two foods your child considers safe. So safe would be known, familiar, and liked. Honestly, that's quite a feat if you can do all of that day in and day out. So that's why I say, literally, take your hand and pat yourself on the back for doing that job. As long as you are providing nutritious meals on a timely schedule and in a positive environment, you are doing your job. After that, just sit back and let your child do his job. Number three, food. So with food, my advice for you in terms of the picky eater, there's, well, first off, there's a ton of advice on what to do with food to encourage your children to try new foods, to like new foods. But just to keep things in perspective and keep it simple for the purpose of this show, when it comes to food, I want you to keep it simple. So Don't serve casseroles initially unless you absolutely know that's going to be a slam dunk. Uh, My kids wouldn't eat casseroles until they were well into elementary school. So I say keep it simple, and that means deconstruct the food. Separate it. A lot of picky eaters don't like their food to touch. 
A lot of picky eaters want to be able to identify everything they're eating. So if you deconstruct the food, it makes it very e easy for the picky eater to see what and know what they're eating. Keep it colorful. Research tells us that taste and appearance are the two key factors in helping children eat healthy foods and move along through the picky eating phase. So if you're planning your meals based on the food groups, you will include fruit, vegetable, whole grain preferably, protein, dairy, and healthy fat. Fruits and the vegetables are the most colorful items that you can put on your child's plate. So get creative with how you present those. Use skewers, cut things up into easy finger foods or bite-sized portions. Don't be afraid to use cookie cutters to create enticing shapes. So that appearance and color and taste matters. So that leads me to my next piece of advice. Keep that food tasty. So don't be afraid to use fat or salt or herbs to flavor up your children's food, especially when it comes to vegetables or grains. You can always wean off of some of these things later on once your child has already developed a liking for those foods. But so often I see parents serving vegetables straight up, like raw with nothing or steamed with nothing but just the straight vegetable. And for many kids, it's just not enough to entice them to eat it. So if you're serving corn, don't be afraid to add butter and salt. The same with any fresh vegetable that you've steamed. Don't be afraid to saute vegetables in oil and soy sauce or with garlic or other herbs. Keeping things tasty ups the ante and ups the likelihood that your child will try those foods. Start small and let your child ask for more. Oftentimes, and I'm seeing this more and more, and I, I want to actually do a show about this, portion sizes. We have evidence in the research literature that tells us that parents tend to offer adult size portions to their children. Not only is this problematic from a weight standpoint, but it can be overwhelming for a picky eater to see a plate heaping with food. So I say start small. Your child can always have more later. If you're at a loss for what a portion size would look like for your child, I do have a starter portion guide on my website. It's a free download. I'll include the link in the show notes but it does give you a sense of how much for each age range. And I do have uh, portions for the two to three year old, the four to six year old and so on. So it gives you an idea where you can start with a portion size and what's reasonable for a child. For the really young children, I always used a rule of thumb of one tablespoon of food per age, per food group. So for example, if you have a one year old, it's a tablespoon of vegetable, a tablespoon of fruit, a tablespoon of grain, a tablespoon of protein. And then you can offer more once they finish those things. Rather than serving a half a cup of fruit, a half a cup of vegetables. And the other thing I do see, frankly, out on the internet is these examples of a of lunchbox or a snack for really young children. And just by looking at them, Many of them, the portion sizes are too large. And if a child who is especially picky gets overwhelmed with too much food, guess what's going to happen? They're going to shut down and they're not going to eat it. Last, when it comes to food, watch out for the sugar. Sugar can really steer the picky eater away from healthy food items. And I think you already probably know my stance on sugar for children under two. I don't believe that we should be routinely adding sweets into the diet of children under two years of age. There's really no room for it when you think about their high nutrient needs and their tiny, tiny tummies. But I also know that particularly when picky eaters like sweets, the sweets get in the way of the picky eater expanding their palate and their nutritious intake. Number four, create 
an environment around eating that keeps your child coming back. So what does that mean? That means I want you to focus on setting up a a happy place for mealtime, a place where your child can come in, be accepted, not be judged, and have a nice time, a pleasant time at the meal table. That's what's going to help your child want to come back to the table time and time again. So what does that mean? It also means don't talk too much about food. Don't nag your child to eat. Don't lay on the pressure to eat whatever you're serving or to try new foods. Because honestly, in the research, again, going back to episode two, the research tells us that pressure just backfires, particularly in the picky eater. They either shut down and stop eating as well as they could be, or they overeat to please their parents. Don't rescue your child with another food he likes or a whole new meal. This is called catering, and I like to call it the short order cook. It limits your child's food variety and his willingness to try new foods. So when you cater or you become the short order cook, you're having a negative long-term implication on your child moving out of the picky eating stage. I have a download, a free uh, guide on the short order cook. Again, that's on my website. It's easy to find just in the search box, enter short order cook, and it will, it will pop up. I'll also include the link in the show notes for you if you want to grab it. So I've gone through the do's and don'ts in this show, but I do also have a free download in the show notes called The Do's and Don'ts of Picky Eating. You might want to just to have as a quick summary reminder of what this show was all about. You can go to www.jillcastle.com forward slash 006. That's 006 for episode six to get that download. Okay, let's summarize what we just went through. There's a few things I want you to remember. Number one, your mindset matters when it comes to how you react to your picky eater. Stay calm, collected, and have a positive outlook to weather the storm of raising a picky eater. Avoid the actions we know from the research that may cause more problems with picky eating and chip away at the relationship you and your child have. And last, remember, you don't have to make your child eat. In fact, you really can't do that in a productive, positive way. Just set up an environment your child enjoys being in when eating. Okay, don't forget to head over to the show notes at www.jillcastle.com forward slash 006. I will have more links related to picky eating and other resources there for you. If you do want my do's and don'ts cheat sheet for this episode, it will be there too. Again, that's www.jillcastle.com forward slash 006. If you feel like you need to understand or want to learn more about how to introduce new foods to kids in the most positive of ways, I invite you to read my three-part series called How to Introduce New Foods to Kids over on my website, and I'll put that link in the show notes as well. If you enjoyed the show, there are a few things you can do to help the Nourish Child podcast reach more people. Write an honest review on iTunes, subscribe to the show, and or share the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Instagram, wherever you hang out, let your peers, your friends, your family know about the Nourish Child podcast. And last, 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 if you haven't joined my Facebook page, Just the Right Bite with Jill Castle, please do. I post childhood nutrition updates there all the time. Thanks for joining me today. I am so very glad you were here. And always, please, please give that little one in your life, even if he or she is a picky eater, a big squeeze today. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to the Nourish Child Podcast, where the number one goal is to help you grow a nourished child inside and out.